Hello and welcome to Pelicar. This is Nuts and Bolts. We're up to episode 9. This is the show where we look at world building as pertains to RPGs and storytelling. Dresden's Tale in particular. Today, I was originally going to talk about the Jinn of Jingendale. I've mentioned him in the story. I think I've mentioned him in a few episodes of Nuts and Bolts. But I was talking to Bart and he pointed out that I was being a little bit premature because we had not talked about taxonomy at all. So we're going to do that a little bit today. We're going to jump into the basics of how Pelicar's creatures are classified. I am your guide in this discussion. My name is Lewis Nichols. I've been around uh, for a while doing this sort of thing. Been a GM for 35 years in various campaigns, a dungeon master, a arbiter of decisions. I've written a few uh, stories, published a few, and uh, I may not be the most qualified or the most experienced out there, probably not even close, but uh, I'm not shy about throwing out my opinions. Now, today, uh, we're primarily talking about the Pelicar gaming system and the world of Dresden's Tale, so I would very much consider myself an expert in that regard, as I am one of the primary creators of that system and the exclusive writer of Dresden's Tale. The Pelicar Bestiary is divided into four sections. The Four Origins of Life. The first are the Zuwala. These are the creatures, what we think of as living beings. They're your plants, your animals. They are things that live off chemical energy. You absorb sunlight as a plant, as an herbivore. You eat plants, and as a carnivore, you eat meat. This is all the same basic process, Uh, like I said, a a chemical basis, and that is what defines the Zuwala. A few things Zuwala include are aardvarks and peacocks, cats, rats, and bats, toadstools, algae in pools, frogs and hogs, some sharks, jellyfish, cuttlefish, orcs and dorks, Horses, oxen, and dragons. Ants, both your relatives and the insect. Trees and bees, lizards, alligators, wyverns, elves, and squid. Now you might be asking yourself, what on earth does that leave? What it leaves are the Dorleon, the Avatars, and the Logathon. So what about these guys? What are they? Well, the Avatar and the Logathon are basically demons and angels. Avatars live off positive emotional energy. Logathon live off negative emotional energy. You could argue that you could put them together, but you know how people are about alignments. They always want their good separated from their bad. And if there's a true divide between good and bad in Pelicar, It's the Avatar and the Logathon. Neither one of these guys gets along with anybody with any sense of practicality. The planes of Pelicar are not split up between higher planes and lower planes. However, there are definitely planes that are more prone to uh, inhabiting Avatar and others that are more prone to inhabiting uh, Logathon. They are pretty much how you would picture them. Logathon planes are dank and dirty and dusty and hot or really, really cold. Generally uncomfortable. Avatar planes, on the other hand, tend to be temperate, nice and peaceful, pastoral, or extremely orderly. Both these types of creatures are often summoned and bound by mortals, by uh, Valito, by magic users or priests. They do not have a great deal of free will. They operate under extreme strictures of what they're allowed to do and what not to do. 
they cannot uh, operate freely on their own on planes designated for the Volito, for, for humanity, so to speak. We've talked about the primary division in these origins being on how they feed. It should be stated that of all of the origins, the Zuala feed the least efficiently. Uh, I don't know about you, but if I go more than uh, six hours without a, a nice hamburger or, or something uh, yummy to put in my tummy, I start to get uh, worn down. When I wake up in the morning, the first thing I think of is breakfast. Some of these non, uh, non-Zuala can go for, for years, sometimes centuries. Uh, they may go into a torpor, they may go into uh, suspended animation, but they can survive. Now, a lot of this energy is generated by the Zuala. All of these other origins are extremely dependent on humanity to provide a food source. The universe does revolve around the Velito. They are very important to the entire existence of the rest of the universe. That leads us to the Dorleon. Five major types. The Dominatus, the Elementals, the Genies, the Spirits, and the Undead. What all these creatures have in common is that they feed off vigor. Vigor is the energy of a Zuala. It's the energetic force that motivates the physical body. It is tied into the biofield. It is tied in to the spirit and the soul. In an earth equivalent, it's that bioelectrical force that fires the synapses and moves the muscles. The Dominatus are the most basic of these forms, the most straightforward. They will absorb into a creature like a ghost possessing a body, but they're not undead, though often confused with undead. They will imbue certain needs and desires and effects, and they will feed off of that body while they are creating these effects. Some of them are funny. They'll make the person glow uh, they can make the person's physical features change. They can change their gender. Uh, you can do polymorph effects or uh, just silly stuff, changing skin color. Uh, they can grant skills if you're willing to pay the price, which a GM should always make sure there is a price to pay. Uh, they can uh, grant great abilities in certain uh, fields. Uh, they can also create uh, non-desirable urges, uh, berserker effects, or far, far worse. Uh, they are directly harmful, feeding off attributes, and they will eventually kill the host. Next, you have the elementals and the spirits existing side by side, both very different but fulfilling similar roles. The elementals feeding directly off of raw vigor, the spirits feeding off of the more refined spiritual energy created by the worship of deities. Elementals occupy the elemental nodes of the astral expanse, great regions of earth, fire, air, and water. They have a strong hierarchy. There are extremely powerful elemental lords and it runs all the way down the ranks to minor creatures that are effectively elemental animals. The same goes for the spirits. Incredibly powerful Samus and Dacus determining the fates of entire regions of civilized land, determining weather patterns causing earthquakes, running all the way down through the ranks to the lowliest little spirit creatures hopping through the forest, fulfilling minor roles, and interacting with humanity. Both of these creatures can work in the celestial hierarchy. Generally, a pantheon chooses one or the other. They can be bound as servants to priests, or they can work behind the shadows, usually both. Next are the undead, the Mosferatu and the Nosferatu, corporeal and non-corporeal, undead, living off the remaining vigor of a dead Velito body. 
These are the ghosts, the poltergeists, the skeletons, the liches, the vampires, the ghasts and the ghouls, all the creatures that haunt the graveyards of all the world's cultures. The greater forms can be allied with the lesser forms easily created and bound to servitude. And yes, the Kelds have no moral qualms in binding great hordes of skeletal armies and allying with the more powerful forms of undead to meet their ends. And finally, we come to the end. What was supposed to be the beginning. In fact, the whole show, the genies. There are a lot of different types of genies. They fit into different cultures across the world, and they tend to have a big impact on those cultures when they occur in large numbers. The Kelds' particular version are the Jinn of Jengendale. The Jinn were on Odessa, worshipping the Kelds, long before the clans came. They raided the Hessians. They certainly didn't get along with the heretics living there. For the most part, though, the Jinn stayed waiting, hoping that the prophecy would one day come true. And then, on the other side of the gates, the Stone Clan came to settle the city of Gates, the city of Parncilia. It was a rough process, but eventually they found those gates and found their way through to Odessa, and a long partnership was begun. The Jinn taught humanity Ziblich, the art of earthly magic, axiom use. But far more than that, they became a friend to the clans. You see, what Jinn do is they bond with like-minded individuals. It's a one-on-one, -on -one, very personal relationship. One that we will explore in detail when I get around to making the episode that is specifically about the Jinn of Jingendale. So with that rather anticlimactic cliffhanger, we're going to wrap up the episode. Uh, if you want to hear more about the Jinn, yeah, you know how to do it. Leave a comment. Otherwise, there's no telling what my next episode will be. Maybe I'll just spend the whole time talking to Bart. As usual, thank you for stopping by. I'd appreciate it if you could hit that like button. Subscribe if you haven't already. That way you never miss one of these life-changing episodes. You can find me on Twitter, at Lewis Nichols. That site, that page, that social media extension of my soul is strictly for Dresden's Tale. None of the extra stuff that you'll find on my Facebook uh, page. However, if you find me on Facebook, I do accept friend requests. The channel is rapidly approaching 20 subscribers. And I appreciate each and every one of you, plus all the rest of you that listen but haven't subscribed. I appreciate you coming by. I thank you very much. And I hope you all have an absolutely wonderful day.